What if I told you that there was one person behind many of the most influential church brands in the world today? We're talking contributions to Voo Church, Maverick City Music, Tim Ross, Taya, Tasha Cobbs Leonard, and she's even worked with Kanye. Her name is Caitlin Hovland. She's here with us today. We're gonna ask her every big question you've ever had about church branding, typography, colors, and everything in between. So let's dive in. Well, hey there, and welcome to the Pro Church Tool Show. We're here to help you and your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. I'm Brady Shearer, your host. I'm joined as always by my co-host. It's Alexander Mills. Hello, hello. And today we are also joined by Caitlin Hovland, a church branding savant. That's the word that I'm going with. Uh, the woman who has contributed to many of what I would say are the most beloved mm -hmm. church brands uh, today. Caitlin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. Thrilled to be here. Thanks to our mutual friend, Ron Starling, for connecting us. And, and I really want to start by talking about uh, your work at VU Church in 2021. This is Miami, Florida. Pastor Rich Wilkerson, Jr. Uh, first, like, how did you get connected with VU uh, to begin with? Yeah, so that was completely a God thing. I really can't take credit for it. Um, I felt God telling me and leading me to move down to Miami, Florida in the middle of the pandemic. Didn't make any sense at all. Um, got down there in 2020, and within eight months, I had made really good friends with the creative team down there. There was just a lot of mutual respect. I loved their work. They loved mine. And within eight months, um, Pastor Rich approached me and said, hey, would you ever consider working for a church? I know that you kind of do the freelance thing, and you do things on the sign on a contract basis, but would you ever work for a church? And I was like, if the Lord tells me to, absolutely. So that's really where it started. And I worked there for about a year. And Worked on a lot of amazing projects, and it was such a fun uh, year. It was such a blast. A few of those projects include VU Summer Vibes, uh, several items for VU Worship, VU Basil. You were part of several of those creative projects, and I know that like the word creative director means uh, many different things. W what to someone that has no experience with something like that, aka me, what does it mean to creative direct projects of that size? Yeah, well, you absolutely have to be able to cast vision to a lot of people and a lot of things, and you need to be able to foresight things. You need to be able to understand your client or your church's vision for it. You know, what's the aesthetic? What's the vibe? What do you want it to feel like? What do you want people to walk away with? Um, and so you really have to be able to, to see that. And then you also have to be able to lead a creative team and help bring them alongside your vision so that they can help execute it. Because um, it's one thing to create a direct um, a, a look and a feel. It's a whole other thing to have 25 people taking it and running with it in other different areas, whether that's the social media team, that's the web team, that's the production team, that's photo and video teams. You really have to be able to communicate that and empower them to keep pushing that vision forward. Okay, so how did you get to the point where this almost sounds like an air traffic controller, you know? We were just on our corporate retreat, so maybe air travel with many children is is at the forefront of my mind. But, you know, you think about uh, an airline, and you got the pilots, but you got the flight attendants, you got people loading the baggage, you got to make sure that in Canada, maybe the wings need de-icing mm -hmm. before you can take off. Now you, being in Minnesota, surely you can relate. And then you got air traffic control, right? And they're making sure there's a lot of planes coming and going, that everyone is safe and on time as much as we can be. Did you first gain experience in all of like the minutia, the stuff on the ground? Like, oh yeah, I know all about colors and fonts and logo design and Photoshop and Illustrator and photography. And then eventually you graduate to where you can direct people or are you like kind of just going straight to direction? That's a really good question and great analogy with the air traffic control. Absolutely. Um, I was in the creative field for about 10 years and I, I really just gained confidence in my own personal craft. It's really hard to explain or ask someone to do things and have an expectation if you don't first understand the weight of what you're asking. Um, so you really need to, at least to some degree, know the nuances of the creative process. And even though I may not, you know, know how to develop a website or I may not, you know, do personally videography, I at least know enough about it to know what I'm asking of, of the team. Um, and you really have to get to know your team as well. You have to know what their strengths are, what their giftings are, what you're asking of them. There's a lot of relationship equity that goes into that as well of mutual understanding and great collaboration. You have to create an environment where creatives can create. Um, there's a lot of environments where creatives feel squashed. Um, they feel like 
intimidated. Um, they can't be intimidated by you as a leader, even if they look up to you. Um, but it's kind of like mentoring, like when you're at a place um, of of wisdom that's maybe a little bit further along, you're able to then you know input that that wisdom into your team. And so, you know, if people look up to you, it's really important to you know come alongside them on their creative process and their creative journey. And I think just having gone through that for 10 years, I knew what it was like. And these people are so talented too. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, you know, farther along as them than in the creative space. But after 10 years of just working in that space, you realize, you know, how to come alongside a creative, you know, if they're not gifted in something, don't force them to do something, really get them in their sweet spot. And if you can get your creatives in your sweet spot, like your team will soar. And so I think it's just an art of, of knowing how to navigate that and collaborate well with your people. It's the perfect analogy, Braid, to bring up air traffic control because we were we were like mid-flight last week from Punta Cana. And my Rebecca, my wife, she looked over at me. She's like, Isn't it just a miracle that like we don't crash into other planes? And my response is like, Yeah, air traffic control. Like computers do a lot of things, but air traffic control is like it's a personal job and it's an important job. And so Caitlin, I, I'd like for you for a moment to talk a little bit about like if air traffic control is one of the most important roles in the sky and keeping everybody safe, like you're directing creative projects, creativity in the church. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what you think the role that creativity plays in the church? I, I got a little bit of insight from your, your, um, your agency's website. You have this big headline that says, uh, enliven culture and expand creativity. So I'm, I'm thinking that, that your vision for creativity in the church is not just to be creative unto itself, but there's more of a broader spectrum of what you think creativity, the role creativity plays in church. Can you talk to us about, about that for a moment? If air traffic, air traffic control is keeping the skies safe and clear, what role does creativity play in the church? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really believe that it's my life's mission to activate creativity in the church, both in the church and in people. You know, the church, we all kind of know it, that the church is about 10 years behind creatively. Um, and really, I just truly believe that the church should be the one's influencing culture and culture shouldn't be influencing the church. It should really be the other way around. We are connected to the most creative being in the entire universe. We should be the most creative beings out there because we have the direct connection to the source. And so really that tagline of enliven culture and activate creativity is just that. I want to be able to awaken people's minds to what possibilities are out there. You know, that's innovation, that's through creative ideas, that's through creative thinking, that's through new ways of doing things, looking at things in a different way. And I just, I really do think it comes down to the leadership. And I'm so thankful to have worked under Pastor Rich in DC because they let creatives soar and they approve things that other church leaders and church pastors wouldn't understand or wouldn't approve. And so the fact that he gave us so um, so much freedom in our creativity really allowed us to be able to do some really impactful things. Um, even being a part of Basel, you know, and being a part of the fashion industry in Miami and being to work, being able to work with Virgil Blow, who was the creative director of Louis Vuitton at the time, like what other church is being able to merge faith and culture and creativity and fashion? Like what other leader has, has been able to enable that? So I really believe our jobs as creatives is to awaken a culture um, and move them to through compassion and through whatever creativity you're creating and compel them to carry forward the mission that you're wanting. You know, if you're a brand or if you're a church, you know, it still carries the same way. If you're working with brands, you know, they have a mission. They want to change lives in the baby industry. They want to change lives in music. They want to change lives. In, and there's usually a, a genuine, beautiful heart behind what they're creating. And so my job as a creative is to look at my clients, whether that's a brand or that's a church, and say, what's your goal here? What's your mission? And how can we as creatives support that and push that forward? So again, when people interact with your brand, when they interact with your church through social media, through a website, you're compelling them. They're sending a message. There's a call to action. There's something you want them to do. And so branding helps push that mission forward. As as pastors are communicating it on stage, your brand is communicating it for you before they've even walked into the doors of your church. So what message are you sending? Are you sending to them, hey, we're people just like you? You know, 
we're, we're broken, we're messed up. You can come as you are, you know, you don't have to be intimidated to walk into a religious space. We're not know-it-alls, you know, what is the message? You know, we're fun. You can find community here. Like there's always a message with whatever you're putting out there. And so we have to be really fine tuned to what is that message we're communicating and does that align with my client's vision? You mentioned not being an expert in maybe web design, dev, videography. You also said pre-creative direction era for Caitlin. There was 10 years of working creatively. I'd like to know like what were your areas of expertise uh, sure. that you kind of got before jumping into kind of the air traffic control role? Yeah, for sure. So I went to school for graphic design, um, got a, a four-year degree with that, and that was amazing. And I, w- I was so lucky that right out of college, I got a job at a full service agency um, here in Minneapolis. And the amazing part about that is even though I was technically drafted into the digital department where we worked with social media, we worked with um, digital ads, we worked in web, um, it was a full service agency. So I got to see how we did things in print. I got to see how we do branding. I got to see how we did commercials. I got to see how we did copywriting. I got to see how we did events and activations. So like the full spectrum of things I think that was pivotal in my junior career to be able to see like, wow, this impacts and affects so many more things than just like my little role. And I I kind of hate when clients come to me and they ask me to do this one small thing because I'm like, there's a whole picture at play and you might think that you'd want just this one thing, but maybe like, let's look at the whole big picture and, and are you sending a cohesive message throughout the entire thing? So I think that's why I kind of got passionate about like making sure um, the dots are connecting between departments because the bigger you get, the more, you know, islands there are and division there is between different departments. So I think it's super important to have that person that's like, hey, are you guys talking to each other <laughs> and making sure that it's all staying consistent? And you mentioned when you were at VU, you are the creative director. So there's like that tier. Um, you're working in that capacity. So then there are going to be creatives underneath you that are working on specific tasks in the overall project. But then above you is Pastor Rich, the senior leadership team, and they're kind of casting vision. Is that an accurate like depiction, like almost like three tiers, three levels to get something of that scale done? Yeah, potentially it can be because you, you always have the client. You always have the business owner. You always have the main lead pastor, executive pastor, they're the people in the boardrooms calling the shots, making decisions. And really, as designers, we need to be chameleons. It's not our vision. And we mm-hmm. might find ourselves in the target demographic of that vision, and we might connect with it. And I think that's a really fortunate thing that Christian creatives have when they work at a church is you're on board with the vision. Like you are a member of the congregation, so you are the target gem- demographic. But at the end of the day, it's not about what you want and what I like to create. Yes, I have a style. Yes, I have an aesthetic. Yes, I have things that I like. But is this right for that church? And I work with churches so many times that um, they want to be, you know, like a VU church in Miami, or they want to be like an elevation or fill in the blank, but they are in small town Tennessee and there is no, you know, cool coffee shops around And so you have to think about, okay, but who is walking into the doors of your church? Mm -hmm. Are these people creative? Are they business owners? Are they entrepreneurs? Are they young families? Are they Gen Gen X? Are they Gen Z? You know, what's the age? What are they into? What do they like? You have to be able to speak to the people that are coming to your church or coming to that brand. Um, And I think that is a a miss sometimes as people... It creatives in the church just want to make a really cool thing and want to make something that's trendy, which might not be totally wrong, but does it work for your demographic and your congregation? Yeah, there's so much of design that like carries over to so many different verticals. Uh, like I think of fashion, and I can think about uh, let, let's take a singular piece of really trendy fashion right now: the Adidas Sambas. So Sambas are this narrow shoe, great for men, great for women. And I don't own a pair of Sambas. Um, If it's Sambas and everyone's yelling at me, (laughs) I apologize. Uh, I saw a TikTok where people were arguing about it, and now I can't remember which one was the right way Mm. of pronouncing it. Caitlin, do you know Samba, Samba? I have no idea. 
Go with Samba and call it the Canadian pronunciation, then you're safe. Oh, yeah, bud. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Sambas, isolated, you might look at them on somebody else and say, that's a great shoe. That's so trendy right now. I want it. But you have to consider it in your body type. Mm -hmm. You have to consider it in the context of the other clothes that you wear. Do you have the right jeans that are going to go with the shoe, for instance? And then, are you a trendy person? Right? Like, it might, might not make sense for you to be like on trend with shoes, footwear that Gen Z is wearing. Or do you have the right foot? Like literally does the shoe fit because they are a more narrow shoe and it's like, maybe you don't have a narrow foot. Yeah, yeah, people always talk about that. They're like, oh my, my foot, I just can't wear an... Do you think that's just, I've never experienced such a thing. Maybe I have, I must not have. I experienced it, okay. <laughs> Sorry for this, Caitlin. You can, you can tune out for a second. Um, in the Canadian context of hockey skates, well, there's hockey in Minnesota. That's true. Um, there, for hockey skates, there are wide, like W sizes, like wide sizes oh, and not okay. wide sizes. So it's gotta be true. Okay. That sidebar, <laughs> that aside, I, if you're okay with it, Caitlin, I wanted to get really granular on a specific mm -hmm. project to flesh out what we're talking about uh, philosophically in terms of, okay, an actual project that got done. So let's talk about VU Summer Vibes. And if you are listening to this episode, feel free to come over to the YouTube channel and watch because we're going to have uh, some of the creative work that, that Caitlin and others at VU worked on to bring this to life on screen so you can see it. Vu Summer Vibes, was this a sermon series? Was it a project, a campaign? What was it specifically at the church? Yeah, so it was actually a unique challenge because it was a month and a half when pastors were going to be on sabbatical and they weren't going to be at the church. You also have a challenge in the summertime when everybody, you know, if, especially if a young congregation, everybody's leaving and going home for, you know, going home from college and people are going on summer vacations, people have summer plans. It's really hard challenge to get people into your church in the summertime. Um, so to create hype and excitement around it and to really get um, people involved and really get people excited to, for coming to church, we had um, a lineup of, it was either four or six guest speakers, um, me, being uh, Lisa Harper, Judah Smith, Erwin McManus, and I'm blanking on the last one right now. Um, but we had this lineup of incredible pastors from out of town who were coming in. We also had an amazing opportunity because these pa this was in the middle of the pandemic. These pastors hadn't yet gotten their, um, their Sunday sermons uh, being able to be recorded because everything was still so shut down. And I don't know if you remember, um, Flo Miami opened up first. And so we were actually having church. So these pastors were not speaking in front of a live audience. They were still speaking in front of a camera. So it was like, oh my gosh, like a gold mine for them. And actually Judah Smith, when he came in, he he preached six sermons in one day because he preached a different message at every single one of our, our sermons so that he could take it home and have a sermon series ready to go for his church. Because he otherwise he's not preaching in front of a live audience. And for a preacher, that's just a nightmare. So we had this challenge and the task was, hey, we're creating the sermon series, Vu Summer Vibes. We need it to be fun. We need to be it to be exciting. We need it to create um, excitement and hype while pastors are out of town. We don't want people to drop off. And so even the rollout of how we teased um, who was coming to that, um, we did a whole thing, like experiential um, environments in the courtyard of different activations and different things people could be a part of and like different cookouts and things like that to get people excited about coming to church. So um, it was super creative. It was really vibrant. It was really playful. And again, it was just, hey, come to church, even though it's summertime, we're having some really fun things happening. Right. So you're starting with the people, you're starting with the problem, and that's what's inspiring the direction. So how do we get from there to the actual font choices, typography choices, are those kind of just gut feelings of, hey, this is the mission for this project. Here is the font that I think best embodies that. Uh, and, and does that kind of just come down to, to personal preference? Yeah, so what's really unique about working on sermon series, and I, I tell every church that I work with um, this, this same thing, your brand has to be so timeless, like your logo, whatever colors you're using, whatever your signage, that has to be timeless because that has to last for the longevity of your church and you don't want to have to go through a rebrand in 10 years. Sermon series are so unique because they can be they can be as trendy as you want. They can be as fun as you want because they're here for six weeks and then you never see it again. <laughs> so 
creatives kind of have a field day when they work on sermon series because it's just fun. And again, when you're under creative leadership who just like trusts you and lets you run with it and lets you create, um, it can be a really fun assignment to have. Um, But you do have to take into consideration, you know, honestly, when I was approached, they said, Caitlin, this is a six week sermon series. Um, It needs to be fun, vibrant, playful, and we need to have a lot of courtyard activations. Go. Like that was my creative brief. I didn't get, you know, I didn't get to read through the sermons and like catch the vision. It's a very short creative brief and you just have to trust your gut and go look for inspiration and put together a mood board. And ultimately at the end of the day, you, you send a mood board to leadership and say, Hey, does this sound okay? Does this look okay? And they're like, yep, go. And you go and create some things and hope that they like it. Maybe they'll come back with some minor edits, but you really have a lot of creative freedom, which is fun with Blue Summer Vibes. So I took a very colorful, classic Miami, creative, artsy approach um, to that project. Before we move to anything else, you just mentioned mood boards. And I feel like that's something that could be extremely useful for people. I know that one of the challenging things when you're working in the creative space with senior leaders, who it sounds like in your case are very well versed in the world of creativity, but for many churches, their senior leader doesn't really have that. And so one of the challenges is you like something, you work on it, you take it a certain way down the you know completion uh, project road, then you give it to them, like, I don't know, this is no good. Mm. And it sounds like this mood board idea is for you to kind of like, hey, here's kind of the arena that we want to live in. What are, you, what are your thoughts on it? So can you tell me, really practical, you said you go out and look for inspiration. Where are you looking for inspiration? How are you compiling that into a mood board? Is there a certain software platform that you're using to do the mood board? It's just like a Pinterest board. What are you doing there? So I work in Adobe Illustrator, so that would be my platform for compiling the mood boards. Um, I try to gather inspiration as I go throughout life. Um, so I'm really addicted to saves on Instagram. Whenever I see something, I save it. I have graphics, video, social media, content, um, art direction, photo shoots. I have a lot of different uh, folders there. I love that they kind of turned Instagram into Pinterest because then I can I can save things. But then Pinterest, um, I'm a classic, classic Pinterest girl. I'm on Pinterest every single day. It's so creative. There's other ones like Dribble and Design Inspiration, um, but I personally gravitate towards Pinterest the most. Um, and then it kind of, you know, it feeds me things at random and I just, I, I could spend hours on Pinterest <laughs> as a creative. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the first question I'm asking, and if you get a chance, a lot of times you don't get a chance to ask questions. You're just kind of told, go make something. Um, but if you get a chance to ask, you know, what feeling or emotion do you want to, um, portray through this sermon series? Cause we just got out of a mental health collection, which would be completely different than, Blue Summer Vibes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was it was definitely moody. It was a little more creative. It was like, what's going on in my mind? Like, it's like, it's almost mysterious. And so it definitely had a moodier vibe, um, whereas that was very fun and playful. So you, you really, yeah, I write down a few words to describe what we want this collection to feel like. And I put, I put a list of words and then I put all my images and I try to go through it depends on how expansive the project is, but sometimes I'll put together a mood board for, you know, the collection. I'll put together a mood board for, let's say if I'm working on a, a, a brick and mortar client example, I just worked on a coffee shop. I'll put together an interior design mood board. I'll put together a merch mood board. I'll put together um, a photo shoot because there's maybe there's a photo shoot involved. I'll put together typography and fonts and colors. So there's really a lot of different aspects and, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, that's so great if the person you're talking to is creative. But if, if they're not, you really have to help them get there. Um, and if they're expressing things to you, you have to be able to interpret and listen because they might be saying they want simple, clean, which every client says they want a clean brand. <laughs> you have to know what they mean by clean. Does that mean thin lines? Does that mean... Oh, does that mean serifs fonts? Does that mean maybe they think sans serif fonts are clean? So you have to ask them questions as to why do you like this? Tell me more about what you're seeing in this image that's making you attracted to it. No, Caitlin, that VU Summer Vibes project sounds like every creative's dream. Like for all the creatives listening, 
they know what it feels like to be kind of unleashed on a project project that doesn't have too many boundaries or restrictions. And as creatives, we know like when you just get to go play and design something that you want to design or design something that, that, that you love, that's a project that like gives you creative energy. Um, but on the inverse of that, there are projects, especially when you are submitting to leadership in church where a vision comes down and it's not maybe your particular aesthetic as a creative or it doesn't give you the same kind of energy that a VU Summer Vibes project would. So how do you counsel creatives on your team or what would you say to creatives that are listening who maybe it's that creative who's working in that small town Tennessee church who wants to design stuff that looks like VU Church but that doesn't resonate with their congregation because their congregation doesn't look like that. How do you counsel creatives that are in that such situation to still do great work even though maybe it's not particularly inspiring or congruent with how they want to design? That's really, really good. And that is very challenging and can be soul, soul crushing for a lot of creatives. You just went um, straight there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> soul crushing is very true. Because, <laughs> you know, I've worked on a few brands and the response that I get from, you know, some pastors is they're like, yeah, we want to be, we want to be fresh. We want to be edgy. We want to be new. We want to do what no one else is doing. And then I show them three concepts and three brands and they end up going with the safest one. And they actually, you know, maybe downplay it and make it even safer. And so there is a little bit of handholding that you can do. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book Influencer. Um, it's funny because that book came out way before influencer marketing was even a thing through Instagram. I think it came out like 15, 20 years ago. But it's about how to influence up, influence down, and influence next to you. How to influence people to get the results that you want. So one of the challenges for that creative is, how can you subtly begin to influence your leadership above you and get them on board? How can you handhold them and, and walk them through, okay, pastor so-and-so who's, you know, maybe six years old, maybe he's a little out of touch with, with something that's happening, you know, what's happening in culture. Um, the church obviously wants this, but there's some fear on the board, because there's usually a board of 10 people, you know, <laughs> manning certain things, depending on how big your church is. <laughs> manning, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So being able to, you know, sometimes it's like turning the Titanic around. It's like this organization has been around for 20 years. You're coming in. You're trying to bring some relevancy. And gaining trust with your leader, like whoever your direct report is, if you can get them to advocate for you, to let you own your lane, because the reality is those pastors and those leaders are owning their lane, mm. but there might be some fear of letting go to let you run in your lane. Um, so as much as you can back up and have an artist statement, if we're going back to college, you have to have the reasoning and the facts and the data behind why you're choosing specific fonts. For colors, for example, there's there's reasoning behind why specific colors portray specific moods. There's reasoning behind different font choices and different things. So if you can just help educate them in, um, and, and handhold them through that process and explain to them why you're making the creative choices that you're making, if you're just making creative choices because like, I think this is dope and this is me and you're salty because you know, you're, you're not getting to do and express what you want to do, make sure you're actually backing up your creative with true reasoning as to this actually needs. And you're also going to have more like oomph and confidence in your argument because you're like, I actually believe that this is what the church needs and this is why. And here's my five reasons why. And walk into the room prepared to say that. Uh, that, that's outstanding advice. I think that's medicine that every creative may not enjoy taking, but we all need to uh, nonetheless, because let's be honest, a lot of the times we make choices because we're like, look, this is, this is it. This is dope. Mm -hmm. This looks great. And I know that because in my circle and what I'm influenced by, this is it. And what we're looking at are the trends in our universe, our age group, our demographic, and we're not considering people that are in a completely different demographic mm -hmm. that are like, what is that even? So if we're just making decisions based on personal preferences, we're almost never going to align because the church at its best is meant to be this mosaic of all these different people that presumably would have different tastes and different preferences. And it sounds like maybe different than many creatives, the time that Caitlin, you spent 
in actual school, getting your degree, laid a foundation that truthfully, so many of us in the church don't have. They have the story of Alex and I, which are like, someone put a camera in my hand and said, go for it. And I just kind of went to YouTube university and learned on the fly. It sounds like maybe that foundation that, that you have has been really helpful in helping you define why you made the choices that you do. Mm -hmm. I think with every project, I try to go into it like, hey, we're in design school. Like even when I'm collaborating, I have several um, people that I hire to help out with Monarch Collective. And even when we're working on a project, like we're in design school, we're like, cool. So do we like that? Why do we like that? And, and it's fun. And we're learning as we go. I, I definitely think we should keep entitlement far away from our resume, no matter how thick it gets. Um, but a perfect example, just to tie a knot on the last conversation is um, thinking through um, like YouTube and the digital space and advocating for production at your church. I think, you know, there's a lot of churches who are really far behind. I think 2020 really helped push that forward. But perfect argument to bring to the table there is, hey, I know that um, you might not feel like social media is valuable to you, but I just need to show you how impactful being able to empower the the video production team or the social media team to hire someone for social media, to make reels, to make clips, to encourage people on social media, to let them know what's happening in, in the life of the church. Um, being able to have a, a solid website, this is pure information that we're able to multiply and you're able to, to touch people's lives who would never step foot into a church. And if we're truly, I'm, I'm assuming, well, I shouldn't assume, but there's a lot of seeker-friendly churches out there. You have to. It's the front door of your church. People see what's online way before they see, before they actually walk into the church and they see you and meet you in person. So as far as advocating for YouTube pages, for anything related digital, it's, I mean, with this podcast, you're proving it. So many people want to hear your content and could you could get it in so many more people's hands if you just would like utilize the tools. So there's so many reasons to advocate for pushing forward creativity in the church. When I looked through your portfolio that we'll have linked in the, the show notes, I feel like there was this signature look to so many of the different creative briefs that you would put together, projects that you would work on, which makes sense, right? If you think about music producers, they had that signature sound. I watched On the Flight Home, The Dark Knight. On the Flight There, I watched Inception. Oppenheimer, when you're listening to this, you'll have known the results of the Oscars from the past weekend, presumably going to win a lot of awards this weekend. Christopher Nolan has that signature look about his direction. How would you define, and this might be challenging, defining your own signature mm. look, Caitlin, but I'd love to hear even just self-reflection, oh, you know what? Project after, pro after project, I reach for a yellow hue or it's this type of font that I gravitate towards. How would you define your kind of signature look? Yeah, um, I really think it was a couple years ago because I think at the beginning of your career, you're playing and you're trying things. You're like, do I like packaging design? Do I like this kind of design? What what is What is my identity as a creative? I think Everyone's just kind of trying to figure that out and they're dabbling in a lot of things. And I think you need to stay in that creative space for a long time um, <clears throat> or as long as you need to. But then, yeah, once you figure it out, um, I think for me, I figured it out probably like three or four years ago. And I ultimately realized how much I loved working with color. And it's funny because I didn't even identify it. It was other people who came to me. They're like, Kaylin, you're the color queen. Like everything you do, whenever you put color palettes together, like you smash it. And I think that was just something that I was naturally gifted at of like knowing how colors work together and how they should balance each other out. And I would see people put together color palettes and I would cringe and I'm like, oh, I'm on the fight against bad color palettes. <laughs> so I think uh, it definitely starts there. And I also just was really real with myself. And this is something I'm super passionate about. Every creative, every Christian needs to know their identity in Christ. And when you know your identity in Christ, you'll know God placed this gifting and anointing on me, X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. It took me so long to admit to myself, oh my gosh, I love fashion. Hmm. I don't know why it was so hard for me to admit it. I think it, it always every creative has imposter syndrome. If, as soon as I realized that, I realized a lot of my references were coming from the editorial world, the fashion world. I really admire and look at big fashion houses like Louis Vuitton. I pay attention to Pharrell. I pay attention to streetwear. I pay attention to any clothing line that's happening. And I think 
I really draw a lot of even photography inspiration from editorial shoots because they're more edgy to me. They're different. They're fun. Um, So I think that's where I drive a lot of my inspiration from. I also really value just high creativity, high innovation. So even when I'm at a photo shoot, I love effects. I love throwing filters and prisms over things. I love throwing color splashes on things. I love um, doing things in post-production, pulling things out, extracting it, layering it. I love, love, love seeing how we can take something. I love when I look at something and I have to sit there. I'm like, how did they make that? Hmm. Like, I don't, I don't understand how they made that. And so I love playing. And I, I, was, I was listening to a podcast recently and it was talking about um, the people who made Star Wars. They were in this um, small film studio And they were just goofing off, playing, collaborating with each other, like truly in design, in in film school, even though they're experts. And they figured out how to do green screens for the first time ever. They literally invented a whole genre of special effects because they were goofing off. So I never want to lose that heart of like, try that. Like, what is, what are you doing there? Try that. And, And then when you work with other creatives and collaborate, you, you spin off of each other and you might not have seen, you, you see something in a way that you might not have seen it without their hand in it. So I really think playing and collaborating, like I just, I love the creative process. I have a creative studio and there's just toys in it and fun things to play with, to try to like mess the happy accidents as Bob Ross would say. I think that's, that's the most successful thing. Get a creative in a fun, creative innovative, inspiring space where they're not afraid to fail and you'll come up with something amazing. What you just said there is so deeply resonant with me when you said you finally admitted to yourself Hmm. in the context of your identity in Christ that like, that you loved fashion (laughs) and that was okay. And that informs like your best creative expressions. Cause I'm a pastor of a local church and one of my biggest like creative projects is a weekly sermon And that's a common refrain you hear from, from folks who are some of the best preachers in the world is like, you know, when you're young, you start, you start trying different preaching voices to try and find who you are. And then you start sounding like the the five preachers you listen to the most. And then at a certain point in your maturity, you start to find your own voice. And, um, uh, one of my favorite preachers, Eugene Peterson, his son says you, every preacher finds their one sermon. And I think yeah, that just like really struck a chord in me to to admit that like this is this is who I am, this is my identity, and I'm gonna own it, and that will be the best expressions of my creativity across a broad spectrum of of, of projects. When I know who I am, what I like, what inspires me, what drives me. Um, yeah, so I just I just wanted to highlight that before before we moved on. But let's get granular now again. I want to talk about church branding and and you've you've hit on a few projects that that you've been responsible for that that aren't uh church specific but now we're talking to small mid-sized churches which are the uh the, the, represent the biggest part of our audience when you are creating a new brand a new brand project for a church what are the typical order of operations for you as the creative director, uh, the creative marketing marketing agency, or maybe just a singular creative volunteering or working in a small local church? What are the typical order of operations for you when approaching a new brand for a church? Yeah, I think in the last couple of years, um, we've really fine-tuned our process for this. And not there's not a rinse and repeat one size fits all process. There's other creatives who come up with brilliant processes as well. For us, um, we lead our pastors through an entire hour-long meeting called a branding discovery call. And what we do in that hour long is we just listen. We we listen to the pastor's heart. We get to know who they are as a person. We get to know what sets them apart. Um, we get to know, you know, what drives them, um, what gives them their passion, why they chose to be a pastor, um, the vision of their church, where they're taking it, where it's going, where is it going to be in the next five, ten years? Whatever we create has to support that. If they're not making it today and they don't have capacity to do it today, it needs to support that. Um, and then asking them about their target demographic, um, asking them all of their value uh, statements. If they have like six value statements, like we want to hear them. And there's usually a very strong cord or thread of we're passionate about worship. Um, we're passionate about 
um, reaching our city and doing I Love My City events. Uh, my church here is like, our heart is global. Um, they're so passionate about reaching missions um, and, and doing tons of missions trips, sending out missionaries. So there's always a like driving force and you need to hear that sound. You need to know what that is. Um, you can't just, again, it's not, branding is not a rinse and repeat. Like, oh, I can make a brand without ever talking to the client. Your brand has to match the client's vision. And I always um, put that back, whatever we land on for that vision, I always put that back in front of the pastors before we go through brand concepts. After we go through brand concepts, hey, here's our mood board. Here's, I put together after that conversation, the next meeting I do is an art direction review. And I take all of those words, all of that heart, all of that emotion, um, and then I put it into um, an art direction, a mood board, and I put it into brand language. So if they don't already have a mission statement, sometimes it's church plants. I help them summarize, okay, what I heard from you is you want to be like this, 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 and this. Does that sound accurate? And usually they're like, oh my gosh, yes, you nailed it. And they feel so validated. It's the classic like therapy technique of like, yeah. so what I hear you saying is this, does that sound right? And they're like, yes, I feel so heard by you. And I promise you at that meeting, they trust you. They're like, this girl hears me. This person knows me. They're nailing it. Like already they feel so like, okay. And you just sat with them for an hour to listen. Cause the tricky thing with churches is you're branding their baby. And there's a, an emotional connection to, they want this thing to be absolutely perfect. So when you take that time, you know, it might feel like, oh, that's excessive. I can do that in a 10 minute call. It's the most important thing. It's setting the stage for your relationship. It's setting the stage for trust. Obviously they hired you. So they, they trust you at least somewhat, but that conversation, like I've gotten pastors to literally break down walls. I was just working with a pastor. Um, and he's, he, he's a part of a well-known church. Um, it's like, I think the church is like 8,000 people. Um, and he, he kind of cringes at the thought of like making his own po personal social media, like, a he's not trying to be a celebrity pastor. It kind of cringes him, but his whole team is like, but you don't understand building your platform as a per, so we're personal branding him, um, to support his church because a lot of people look up to him. A lot of people mentor him and to help him understand like, no, this isn't like a cringy thing. This is, this is your ministry being pushed forward and more people are going to be able to hear it. And you could see his like, all his walls like came down when we put it like that. And now there was trust. Now he didn't feel cringy about it. Like he felt so heard and validated. So anyways, getting back to the art direction, we put all that back in front of them and we show them a few mood boards and say, all right, this is the first time we're going from words to pictures. Does it feel right? What, what do you like? What do you like? What do you not like on this board? Sometimes if it's clear, I'll put together one board. If it's not clear, they're kind of not sure what they want. I put together five boards and we walk through all of them and I, and I sit there with them and I ask them, why do you like this? Why do you not like that? Explain, um, tell me more about that. And, and you can catch it in their language of describe. That's why I will never, I will never send a mood board over email because I can't hear them. And, and I don't think that they're going to respond. They're going to type out all of their reasoning I have to hear them. It's either a, oh my gosh, yes. Or it's a, mm, I don't know about that one. Yes to that. So yes, you have to go through that interpretation phase. And then from there, once we have the target, once they've approved the mood board, they've approved all the brand language, um, and you put all that back in front of them, then we say, okay, are we on the right track? I'm like, are you with me? Okay, we're doing this. All right, next phase I'm going to meet with you in a couple of weeks and I'm going to put together three different directions. This is how we do it. This is why I say creatives can do it so differently. We put together three different directions um, that are completely baked start to finish. I don't show them 20 logos, which I think is a huge mistake that creatives make um, because then they get really nitpicky and granular. Like we as the creatives put the best three logos in front of them. We show it to them in black and white. We show it to them in every single direction um, that's left justified, centered, horizontal, vertical, a patch, you know, whatever it is, all the different expressions of it, the icon, the word mark, everything. Then we introduce color. Then we introduce fonts. We, we walk them through the, this 
strategy of using the two to three fonts. Here's how they're going to be used. And then we show them the brand and color now. So that starts to come to life. The logo starts to come to life. Then we don't stop there. We need to put this in marketing. We need to show a few mock-ups of you know, what a church invite could be, what the front page of a website could be, what a social media post could look like, um, what some merch could look like, you know, whatever um, marketing examples are helpful to get your mission across. Um, we show those, show some mock-ups, then we do a summary. Now I show the other three, and then we, we walk through all of it and ask them what they think. So the, the point of going from that start to finish is you can't envision a brand with just a logo. You have to see, okay, what does that mean now on a flag outside at the front? That changes everything. You have to see the colors, the design elements, the fonts, the photography. Photography is something that a lot of people forget and skimp on. Um, so you have to see all of that working together to know if you like the essence of the brand. And again, we're putting all that brand language and that art direction and back in front of them saying, this is what you said you wanted it to feel like. These three directions better feel like that. And usually when I use that process, I get so they usually pick one direction and there's very minimal edits. That was gold. That was Caitlin in her branding bag mm -hmm. laying Perfect. out the wisdom. Yeah. I, uh, I, there's so many questions I have for you. So I'm just going to go straight to the next one and not waste any time with anyone <laughs> listening to me. You mentioned photography at the end yeah. of uh, that outstanding um, outline of what you're doing. And that clearly, when I'm looking through your portfolio, plays a big role in the brands that you're putting together. Uh, when Kanye was doing his Sunday service tour and came through Miami, uh, you were doing photography for that. So how does photography play a role in this? Or maybe even a better question is like, okay, what are the best practices mm -hmm. for photography and integrating those within a brand? What is your creative eye seeing with photos? Yeah. So photography is something that I have a huge passion for. I love being in a studio. I love playing with lighting. I want to be the first to say I'm not a photo expert. I didn't go to school for photography. I didn't, I, I learn, I can dabble a, a camera slightly, but I bring people in who are experts at what they do. I art direct and I maybe I influence the stage, the set, the aesthetic of the whole shoot. And then I bring in an excellent photographer. I bring in um, someone who's bomb at lighting because to get a cool lighting effect, like you have to know what you're doing. Um, so I always bring the experts along in it with me to help support the vision. And even creatively, if I don't know how to do an animation, I'm hiring, I'm bringing on an animator. So um, I think that's super important to not be afraid to bring more people in. I think sometimes people hold and they're like, this is my project. And they, they feel, you know, a sense of control that they're afraid, but you, you got to let people in. It's going to make things so much better. So um, process with photography. Um, I, I do the same thing. I put together a mood board, put together a vibe and an aesthetic. Um, I definitely think it's something within a brand that can take your brand to the next level. I tell people all the time, get outside of your computer. I know that you're a designer. I know that like this is your tool and this is your space. Get outside of a computer, like even printing out a graphic and taking a photo of it, like changes the entire graphic. <laughs> and so working with multiple mediums, um, I think is, is very, it's just a really good practice to be able to do that. Um, and then, yeah, when you're working on a brand or a sermon series, our best sermon series or collection of talks um, was the, the best ones were when we did an entire photo shoot around it. So Vu Girl, we did one for, for Crew Ketchup. We did like this camping theme and we did like a very Wes Anderson-y um, photo shoot that went along with it. And it was like, hey, grab your friends, go to Crew Ketchup. It was just it came so much more to life when like you had, when you had that to bring to the table because photos in of itself, like I know it's cliche, but a picture is worth a thousand, thousand words. And to bring that alongside color and now clip things out, put filters on it, create fun effects. Um, it, it tells a really cool story and it also begins to look like something you've never seen before. Because even if you tried to perfect, perfectly um, mimic a photo that you've seen. Like, this is our inspiration photo. This is what we want it to look like. You're not going to nail it. It's going to be creative and beautiful in its own way. And it's, it's one of a kind. So I think photography makes things really 
one of a kind. Final thing I wanted to ask you about was your work with Maverick City. Grammy nominated work. Amen. That's correct. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. uh, what you were doing there. Yeah. So again, this is just, you know, the Lord's favor. And I literally can take no credit for this. But um, when I was working at VU, um, well, after I actually done working at VU, afterwards, um, you never know who's watching you. And that's the beautiful thing about social media is, you know, you never know who's listening to this show. You know, you never know who's paying attention, who is really inspired by you. And, and um, I had, his name is Norman, and he is the founder of Tribal Records. Um, so founder of Maverick City, House Fires, um, Naomi Chandler, everyone under his label. The, the Rosses, I believe, are actually under his label as well. Um, and so he approached me and he right out of the gates, just said, hey, I've been keeping tabs on you for the last year. I love everything you touch. Love your creativity. Um, we're actually working on an all-women's tour. This was called It's Time Tour. That was with Natalie Grant, Tasha Cobbs Leonard, um, Taya Gok Roger, and um, Naomi Rain. And those four ladies ended up coming together to be four leading women voices. So it was one of the first all-girls tour to happen. And he was like, we really want a female creative director who can sit down with these ladies and really understand how to take four very different personalities and mash it into one tour. And we think you're the girl for the job. And he straight up told me, he's like, you don't have to send us a resume a portfolio. He's like, you're hired. Like we want you. And that was probably the most flattering thing ever to happen. Um, and so I started literally the next week we went and did a content shoot and it was a whirlwind from there because it was a very short timeline um, and turnaround time. But I basically got to creative direct the entire tour, um, oversee the content shoot, oversee the social media, um, oversee all the graphics that were going out for it. And then through that, so that was obviously under the tribal records label. So then the next ask from them was, hey, Maverick City is coming out with an album. They haven't come out with an album in a few years. Fans are really like anticipating this new release. Um, we want you to design the album covers for it. And we want you to create a direct kind of the whole essence of the tour um, as well in a similar vein that you did with its time. And that, again, just so, so honoring. Um, but it's funny because there's so many designers that could be in that position and so many incredible people out there that it just really felt like right place, right time, right opportunity. And to say, I'm so thankful. And you never know when you're creating something, if it's going to get nominated for a Grammy. Obviously, you're hoping for that. But that was just a really beautiful moment to see that, to see your work up at the Grammys. Um, so that was just very rewarding as a creative. But um, yeah, for that, again, they barely gave me anything. And Norman was like, okay, Hub, we trust you. I know you're going to smash it. Go do your thing. And I was like, okay. Like, on one hand, you're like, sick. I can make anything I want. On the other hand, it's like, can you give me a word? Can you give me something? And at this point, those songs weren't even re fully recorded yet. They gave me like five songs. They had God Problems. Um, they had obviously more than able. They had, they had already a few songs out. Um, and so I kind of caught the essence of it. Um, but I really had to just pull and pray because they asked me for concepts within three days. And so I came up with 33 concepts in three days. And I was like, I don't know what you want. Here's a bunch of stuff. I hope it's six. What do you like? And they were cool. We, they were like, cool, we want these seven. We want these ones for these singles. We want these ones for the album. We want this one for the EP. And um, yeah, from there, then I exported it and created like a branding style guide because then their team took it and put it on all the pre-release graphics, the promotional graphics, and it really got blown out from there. Um, so it's funny, you think about, oh, I'm just creating an album cover. It's like, no, you're creative directing the whole essence of what this thing is going to be for the next six months. So with that in mind, there still has to be, you know, meaning and intention behind it. You can't just randomly make something that looks cool. So that was a whirlwind of a project. They're, they're notorious for very short timelines. So it was fun and I really needed God to help me, but we got through it. <laughs> uh, Caitlin, you can hear just the years of wisdom and how much work you've done coming out in every single answer and truly appreciate your time. If people want to connect with you, uh, work with you, what is the best way to do that? 
Yeah. Um, my personal Instagram would be Khov, um, K-A-Y-H-O-V. Um, I post a lot of creative stuff on there, my journey there. Um, if they want to work with me, I have two different sources for that. I have Monarch Collective, um, my studio. Um, we're, we're kind of a, we're operating as like a full service studio. So monarchco.studio is the website. Um, and then if they're a church um, and they really want help rebranding, relaunching, I have a ton of resources um, on brandyourchurch.co. And I really created brandyourchurch.co because I was working with so many churches, creating custom content for them, custom branding. And that just really adds up. It doesn't matter what creative you're hiring. It can become really expensive to work on marketing for an entire year. Um, but I noticed that all these churches were actually looking for a very similar thing. Um, and so rather than having people come and ask for custom work for me, I created a ton of templates, um, social media uh, templates, um, best practices. I basically created templates for the 10 key areas of um, a church, and that would be um, social media, merch, um, a Sunday serve at Sunday series, whether that's announcement graphics or series graphics, um, their growth track, whatever they call their next steps class, the connect corner, the welcome experience, um, their launch plan pack. Um, and I really just created a ton of tools and resources. So go to brandyourchurch.co for anything related to that. Um, yeah. I can vouch for brandyourchurch.co. I was on that website all morning mm -hmm. and it looks outstanding and surely is a great investment for, uh, for many, many churches. Thanks again uh, to Caitlin. Greatly appreciate her time and thank you for your time, attention, and trust. We'll talk real soon. Her name is Caitlin Hovland, and she's here today. We're going to ask her every question you've ever had about church branding, typography, fonts. That's the same as typography. <laughs> her name is Caitlin Loveland. No, her name is not <laughs> Loveland. It's freaking... <laughs> what is wrong with me? I don't know.